This is a 1999 Nissan Skyline GTR, better known to car enthusiasts as the R34 GTR. Despite endless pleas from car enthusiasts, this car was never sold in the United States. You can't get them here. Only a handful were ever imported legally, and they can't be imported anymore. Today, I'm here in Los Angeles, California with one of the handful, and I'm going to show you around it. First, a little Skyline GTR history for you. Now, you already know about the current GTR, which has been sold in the United States for the last decade. This is the model right before that, and it was sold from 1999 to 2002. Now, before this, there were a couple of others. The R33 sold in the mid-90s, and the R32 in the late 80s and early 90s. I had one of those, and there were also a couple of Skyline GTR models in the late 1960s and 1970s, but this one, the R34, is the one that everybody wants. The reason is video games and movies. I still remember playing Gran Turismo 2 when I was 12, and this was the coolest car in the game. Then Too Fast, Too Furious came out when I was 15, and there wasn't a kid who went to see that movie who didn't want to own this car. I spent all of my birthday and lawn mowing money to buy a high quality auto art scale model of the R34 GTR in Bayside Blue, this color. Nissan eventually acquiesced to the pressure, and they brought the next generation GTR to the United States, and that was great, and we all loved it, but we also all still kind of wanted this one, the last best GTR we couldn't have. And yet, here it is in California. Now today, I'm going to take you on a tour of this Skyline GTR, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and cool features, and then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive my childhood fantasy, the R34 GTR, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the R34 GTR and for a full review, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. I'm going to start back here with these Tail lights. These are some of the most famous tail lights in all of performance cars. If you're a car enthusiast at all, you know this tail light pattern. Now, there are a couple of unusual things about the tail lights in this car, one of which is when you press the brakes, all four red circles don't light up like I always thought. It's just the ones on the outside. All four circles do light up, however, as the tail lights when you turn on the headlights. Now, the little orange circle in the inner ring is the turn signal, and obviously it lights up when you put on the turn signals or the hazard lights. On the bumper, there are a couple of other lights you'll notice down there. One is red red and one is white. The white one is the reverse light. It comes on when you're in reverse. And the weird thing is there's only one reverse light on this car and it's offset. On the right you see the red light and that is the rear fog light. Cars in Europe and Asia often have rear fog lights. You're supposed to turn it on in foggy conditions to let other drivers know that you're there. And that's it, the famous rear end of the R34 GTR. Next up, we move on to the rear wing. Now, in images of this car forever, I've always known that it had a rear wing, but I never knew that it's adjustable. Take a look at this. You can actually move the wing several degrees in either direction for your optimal track setup. You can put it up or in the middle or down. After you've adjusted the wing, you can lock it in place with a little screw. As you can see, there are a couple of little holes where you can set it and keep it there, middle, up, or down. In order to lock the wing where you want it, pop off this end cap and you can stick a screw through those holes holes and into the adjustable flap to keep it in place. Who knew that the wing on this thing adjusted? Obviously it doesn't pop up or down like in a Porsche, but this is an early adjustable wing. It's also worth noting that the positioning of this rear wing is absolutely terrible. It robs your rear visibility like crazy. It's directly in your line of sight. Modern wings are often higher to get out of your rear visibility, and obviously a lot of cars had lower wings too. This one is right in the middle. Something else in the back of this car that I've always loved, it has a rear wiper. Now that's not all that unusual. Hatchbacks, station wagons, SUVs have rear wipers, but cars with trunks never do. The only car in the United States that I can think of that had a rear wiper and a trunk is the Evo, so apparently it was a Japanese thing. And indeed it was. A lot of Japanese cars in the 80s, 90s had this. My R32 GTR had it, and this car does too. It even has a rear washer jet, so you can wash the rear window at your leisure. Next up, we move on to the trunk. Now you look inside the trunk, and it's a fairly normal sized trunk, and it looks pretty normal for a Japanese car of this era, but you'll notice that there's a lot of 
stuff right here. Well, usually there's a trim panel there, but the trim panel is gone so that I can show you there are a lot of ECUs in the trunk. They're here for weight distribution. There's one in front, there's four back here. The third is that that helps balance the weight of the car. Now the ECUs obviously control a lot of things. And one of the things is rear wheel steering because this car has four wheel steering. The four wheel steering in this car is actually quite interesting. At low speeds, the rear wheels turn opposite the front wheels in order to give you a smaller turning circle and help you get around corners quicker. At high speeds, they turn at the same angle in order for you to be able to make high speed lane changes or other moves quicker. In order to do this job properly, the four wheel steering system uses, among other things, this yaw sensor. I love the warning on top of this thing, don't drop. Okay, little yaw sensor, thanks for the advice. Also interesting is the all-wheel drive system, which was a huge deal back when this car came out. The car was basically rear-wheel drive until you needed it, and then it could send up to 50% of the power to the front wheels. That's pretty common today. Maybe more interesting than the function of the all-wheel drive system was the name. It was called a Tessa ETS Pro, and this was an acronym. It stood for Advanced Total Traction an engineering system for all terrain <laughs> with electronic torque split. If that's not the most complicated 90s Japanese acronym they could have come up with, then I don't know what is, it's ridiculous. Next we move on to the front of the GTR where there are a couple of items worth noting. One is the badge in the middle of the grill. You'll notice it doesn't say Nissan, it says GTR. That was the factory badge. In fact, this car did not come from the factory with any Nissan badging. This car was not a Nissan, it was a GTR. That was the most important thing for you to understand. As a result, you'll find several GTR badges. This one, there's one in back on the trunk. There are GTR center caps in the wheels but there is no Nissan badge. Another interesting thing in the front of this car, this is a very famous front end associated with this vehicle, but here's something I didn't know. These little lights in the bumper, I always assume they were fog lights. They're actually the turn signals. Who knew that the R34 GTR's turn signals were in the bumpers? Now you know. Climbing into this car for the first time, the most interesting thing you'll find is definitely the center screen, which had me in total awe. I promise you'll want to see this, and remember this car came out in 1999, which is nearly 20 years ago. This is sort of the home screen, and it shows all sorts of different measurements. You can see some of them change in real time as I rev the engine. Next up, press the mode button, and you can change to a screen that shows G-forces again in real time, which would have been huge in 1999. Press mode again, and this screen shows you the last 30 seconds of various different vehicle measurements and it's fully configurable so you can choose what you want to see. For instance, here's oil pressure and you can see the digital readout change as I rev the engine and you can see the display showing the last 30 seconds of engine revs. Oddly, it almost lets you see too much. For example, who would want to see the last 30 seconds of water temperature? But you can. The next display is called twin display and it lets you see two gauges at once. Of course, those are configurable. Next, you get into my favorite menu. It's called red zone and it lets you adjust the levels in the home screen where the green bars turn red. I've turned down the one for boost and now you can see the green bar turn red as I violate my newly configured maximum setting. Then there's the shift up menu. You see this little light here next to the screen? That's a shift light and it turns on when it's time to upshift. But here's the thing, in the shift up menu, you can adjust where the maximum upshift should be and thus where the shift light turns on. And then by far the craziest item is the lap timer function. You see this little black button in the center console next to the shifter? Okay, push it and it starts timing your lap like a stopwatch. The second lap starts when you push it again like I just did. The amazing part is over here to the left of the center console. You see this wire? That's so you can hook up to your 1999 laptop and download all of your vehicle data including your lap times and other measurements. Interestingly, one last item. I'm zooming in here so you can see oil pressure. Do you notice that it's about 1.8 or 1.9? Well, here's the normal oil pressure gauge on the instrument panel and it's reading almost three. Despite all that technology, Nissan couldn't make these things give the same reading, which is truly hilarious. But that center screen isn't the only weird thing about the interior. There are a couple of other interesting quirks worth mentioning, starting with the gauge cluster. Now, the gauge cluster in this car is a Nismo accessory. That's Nissan's in-house tuning company, so the gauge cluster would have been dealer installed when the car was purchased. Now, the thing I like most about the gauge cluster is the tachometer. The tachometer in this car goes all the way up to 11,000 RPMs, although the owner tells me the fuel cutoff is at 8,000. But Let's be honest, it is cool to see that 11 on there. Now, in order to make it go to 11,000 RPMs, they had to make zero through 3,000 RPMs especially tiny. I guess you shouldn't really care about that. Why are you driving at 3,000 RPM anyway? That's nothing. 
Another interesting quirk, obviously this car is right-hand drive, and so that means that the turn signals and the windshield wiper stocks are switched. The turn signals are on the right, the windshield wiper stock is on the left. Now, that's only true of right-hand drive cars sold in Asia. It's worth noting that right-hand drive cars sold in Europe, in the UK and in Ireland, for example, will have it on the other side, like a normal left-hand drive car. The turn signal will be on the left, and the wiper will be on the right. So when automakers make right-hand drive cars, it's country-specific where the windshield wiper stock and the turn signal stock go. It's also worth noting that that can get rather challenging when you go around and drive this car because you go to put on the turn signal and then you've turned on the windshield wiper. You have to keep in mind that the turn signal is switched and it's on the other side or else you'll be constantly forgetting. Another interesting item, this car has power folding mirrors, which is unusual. It's usually an item you associate with modern luxury cars, but this car has them. In order to activate them, you flip a little switch on the driver's door panel next to the power window switches, and then the mirrors fold in. Flip the switch the other direction, and they fold right back out again. That's for all those times you're going to park your Skyline GTR on a narrow street, which may actually be a concern in tight areas in Japan. Another interesting control on that vicinity worth noting is just to the right of the steering wheel, that would be the headlight leveler. If you look over there, you'll see a little dial labeled zero through three. Now, when they're on zero, they're in their highest setting, and as you twist the dial, they go lower and lower to change what your headlights are illuminating on the road in front of you. Another interesting item inside this car, like many cars, this car has a reverse lockout. So you have to pull up on a little tab in order to get it into reverse. That's to make sure that you don't accidentally shift into reverse when you're going for six. That makes sense. But this car takes it a step further because this car has a first gear lockout as well. It's a very unusual feature. In order to shift this car into first, you also have to pull up on that tab. The idea here is to prevent you from accidentally shifting into first when you're going for third, which could cause severe damage to the engine. And so every time you shift into first, you gotta pull up on that tab. Also worth mentioning is the seat material. Now this car has these tight little grippy sport seats that really hug you in corners. The owner tells me they're absolutely great. And they're covered in these little rubberized dots, which look very odd, but the owner tells me they're really functional. The dots actually help to keep you in place. No, it doesn't look as nice as leather or Alcantara, but they work. Interestingly, the rear seats are also covered in the rubberized dots, which means that your kids can stay in place as you take them around hard corners on the racetrack. Another interesting thing about this car's interior to me is that it's just so normal. If you look around the interior of this car, you might be surprised to find that Godzilla, the famed R34 GTR, has a lot of stuff that just looks like it comes out of basically every other late 90s and early 2000s Nissan. The window switches, for example. Normal Nissan window switches. The door lock switch, same deal. The door lock itself and the door handle. In fact, the entire door panel looks like just from a regular Nissan. Get into the middle of the interior and you'll find that the climate controls look like they're from a regular Nissan. Same with the climate vents and the hazard light switch. The turn signal stock and the wiper stock are really pulled out of regular Nissan models. In the middle here, there's a center console with a normal amount of center console storage and right ahead of that there's a little cup holder it's small but it fits japanese size cups it even has a normal glove box although what's in the glove box is a little less than normal that's where you'll find the owner's manuals, which I absolutely love. I'm going to start with the navigation system owner's manual, which has this ridiculous 90s looking picture of some sort of Japanese city. It looks like a phone book. Now, the coolest thing about this owner's manual is that when you open it up, it has all the instructions in Japanese, but it also shows little images of the navigation system confused if you go, for example, under some trees or into a tunnel. They show the navigation system as a little character. He's this cute little guy and he can't, he can't figure out, he's not getting any signal. That's the navigation system manual in a Skyline GTR. The owner's manual, obviously I can't read any of it except the cover, which says on it, and this is a direct quote, Skyline the best driving pleasure. <laughs> That's kind of hilarious. Also hilarious is the fact that on the back of the two manuals that says Life Together Nissan, which must have been their slogan at the time. These are the owner's manuals you get when you get a Skyline GTR. And look at the floor mats. You see that pattern? You may not remember this, but everybody was doing stupid patterns like that on fabrics in cars in the 1990s, on floor mats, on door panels, on seats. And that even carried on to the famous Nissan Skyline GTR.
Speaking of the floor mats, one other interesting thing is the floor mat label. There's a little label that tells you how to install the floor mats in the car. That's not that unusual. The unusual part is that it's on the top of the floor mat, so it basically is always visible and it's very ugly. I guess you were supposed to pull it off once you learned how to install the floor mat. But this one still has its original floor mat label in place. Good luck finding another GTR with that. Pebble Beach 2057, this floor mat label will be what the judges are looking for. Next up, earlier you may have heard me mention that this car has back seats. Well, I think you know what comes next. Now, to get to the back, you fold the seats forward and then there's this little seat belt right there and it's going to make it very difficult to get in back but you can just fold it out of the way and then you can climb in very very easily very simple to get in back here oh 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 that's not so bad of course, the driver now has no place to sit. Now, there's nothing interesting in the back seat of this car. This car really wasn't designed for people to sit in the back or really enjoy themselves if they're back here. The only thing interesting is there's another floor mat with that ridiculous pattern that goes all the way across the entire floor of the back seats. That is it. Okay, so now it's time to drive it. But first, you're probably wondering how it's possible that this Skyline GTR is here in the United States. Well, I have one word for you, Motorex. Let me back up. Right now, it's very difficult to import a car into the United States unless it's 25 years old, but it's not impossible. In order to do it, you have to go through all sorts of regulatory hoops. You have to submit emissions paperwork and certification at the EPA. You even have to go through crash testing. The cost is massive, well over a million dollars. But in the early 2000s, a company called Motorex saw the demand for the Skyline GTRs and they decided to jump through the hoops and spend the money. And yes, they even crash tested a Skyline to prove that it was roadworthy. After a lot of work and a lot of money spent, Motorex got the US government to agree that they could sell the R33 GTR to customers in the United States after they performed certain modifications to make it legal for US roads. Now, Motorex also decided that they wanted to sell the R32 and the R34 GTR, but that would have required a lot more work and a lot more money spent getting those cars certified. So Motorex decided to import those cars anyway and just tell the government Government that they were R33 GTRs. Then Motorex decided to just stop performing the work to get the cars US certified in the first place. In the end, there was a government raid on Motorex. They ceased operations, but a few dozen vehicles had been sold to US buyers who believed they were buying legally imported cars with US government certifications. And so, showing an unusual amount of generosity for a federal agency, the government allowed those buyers to keep their cars. Those cars were grandfathered in under the theory that those buyers bought the cars thinking they had been properly certified. And so those few dozen cars have a letter from the United States Department of Transportation saying that they are legal and that they will be legal forever. As a result, these are basically the only legal Skyline GTRs in America that aren't 25 years old. And this is one of those cars, likely one of just 12 to 14 Motorex R34 GTRs in the entire country. Anyway, with that interesting story out of the way, time to get the R34 GTR out on the road. Okay, driving the R34 GTR, this is so cool. Man, I, I'm just remembering as I start driving this car how much I hate driving right-hand drive vehicles. <laughs> it's just very annoying. People who drive them frequently say they get used to it, but I, uh, I never got used to it and I really just hate being on this side of the car. It makes visibility very difficult. I'm not a fan. I feel so cool. And, and the re one of the reasons I feel cool is that while I was filming this video on a, in a secluded elementary school on a Saturday morning uh, in a parking lot at a dead end, several people walked up to us and, and were talking to us. Oh, the GTR, the R34, they're so excited. You can't escape it when you have this car. The attention is unbelievable, especially in this color, stock with these wheels. I mean, this is the Gran Turismo car. This is the car we all knew about when we were when we were growing up. Now, I had an R32. This car feels tremendously already, it just feels tremendously more substantial. Nissan rated both vehicles at 276 horsepower which was the power rating that all Japanese car companies gave to their vehicles at the time as part of this agreement that they wouldn't start getting into this power war, uh, which could lead to people getting hurt. 
So they were all 276 horsepower, but this car really was more like 320. It feels like a real car. The R32 felt like an old car. This car feels like a, you know, a modern vehicle. <laughs> feels very quick. So this car is stock. This is how it would have been if you were in Japan back in, in 1999 picking one of these up. I mean, this was what it was. Of course, all of these cars have been modified, but this one is still in in, in stock condition and uh, so this is kind of cool to, to experience this and not drive one that's 10,000 horsepower or whatever like most of them. Uh, just a little bit of throttle and uh, and you can start to feel the power. This car doesn't feel slow. Even though this car is 20 years old, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like a 20 year old car in that sense. It doesn't feel like, oh, this, this car is fast for 20 years ago. Turning the wheels easy. I mean, this is an easy car to drive. It, it actually, it feels in a lot of senses, it feels like a Nissan except I'm sitting on the other side of the car. Yeah, I, felt, I always felt my 32 was pretty quick. This car is really cool. <laughs> Wow, it really gets going. I, I, I'm not at all surprised by that. I mean, this car this car was the, the king of every video game throughout the 2000s. Of course, it's quick. One thing I'm really taken by is just how modern it feels. I, it doesn't feel uncomfortable. It really feels like I'm sitting here in, 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 a, in a fairly recent car. And everybody stares at you, huh? California's got such a car culture um, that, that that's going to be a part of it. And, but it's just crazy to me how everybody is, everybody knows the car. So sitting at a stoplight, the car doesn't shake or rattle or make any weird noises or anything like that. It feels like you'd expect a modern car. The clutch is really easy to operate. It actually surprises me. It's not notchy. It goes in at a, at a normal rate. Um, it's very easy to feel already. Um, where, you know, where to let it out, where the catch point is. Now looking in the rear view mirror, uh, yeah, that, that wing is really, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's actually funny, there's a Prius behind me. The wing reminds me of the Prius's situation where the glass is split. When you look back there and there's some, there's a part of the back that you just can't see. That's exactly what this is like, except it's bigger. It's very easy to shift between gears in this car. Very easy to push the clutch in this car. It's even easy to rev match, although I always have problems rev matching in right-hand drive cars because mentally I just used to doing this and not this, but eventually I think you get the hang of it. The car, this car feels tight. Uh, it still, fe it still feels really uh, like it's well built and uh, it doesn't feel like it's even coming close to falling apart. The ride quality is a little bit harsh, you can tell. I'm struck, one of the things I'm struck by is just the, how normal this car is. You know, I'm just driving around Burbank and uh, it doesn't feel to me like I'm driving Godzilla, the, one of the great cars of all time, whatever. And part of the reason I think for that is that it actually ends up being a pretty good, uh, just sort of normal car if that's what you want it to be. I think one of the benefits of this car like Porsches is that you can drive them crazy fast if you want if I had a track to go on or something but you can also just sort of drive them it's quick the steering is really quick the steering is modern car quick and uh, that's actually kind of impressive there's a little bit of vagueness on center you wouldn't find this if this car came out today in the new GTR uh, the steering is a lot more precise the moment you start to turn it and in this car it's just a little bit less and that was just how it was done forever until now only now of cars become like doo, doo. Everybody knows this car. It's so hilarious. There's somebody in a Volvo C70 just gave us a thumbs up and a wave. Man, I'm probably going way too fast. God only knows it's, it's really quick and it's it's fun and it's addicting to kind of floor it and, and really enjoy it. Um, because the sound is amazing and honestly it's not difficult to build power uh, this this is the kind of car where where when you floor it it's just like keep going keep going because it's smooth and it's quick and it sounds good the guy behind us is excited the two guys behind us are very excited you know I would flip if I saw one of these especially in this color pre-stock I mean I would lose it I would go crazy uh, but I'm surprised how many other people are the, the funny thing is every one of those people is a car person that's kind of cool right this is not if a normal person saw this car they, would, they wouldn't care, except, oh, someone's driving on the right, and that's weird. But everyone who's a car, everyone who's a car person, doesn't matter what you're into, it's hard not to appreciate the R34 GTR. Seeing on the streets in America, in California, that's a cool feeling. And so that's the R34 Skyline GTR. I've always idolized this car since I was a kid and I've always wanted to own one. And I'm thrilled that I at least got to spend the day with this one. Now, these Motorex R34 GTRs, because they're basically the only legal R34s in the country, they command a huge price premium. They sell for at least $80,000 or more, which is too much for me. But in seven years, this car becomes 25 years old and then the floodgates can open and I might just 
just have to import one so I can finally match that scale model I had when I was a kid. Anyway, on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, look, I love the R34 GTR, but let's be honest, the only reason we think this car looks cool is because we think this car is cool. It's not classically beautiful or attractive, and it gets only a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, it does 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds. I told you it's modern car fast, and that gives it a 7 out of 10. Handling is good. It corners flat, and the steering is nice, but it's an older car. It's not small like a Miata, and it has some on-center vagueness. It gets a 7 out of 10. Cool factor is easy. 10 out of 10, especially in the United States right now, and if you disagree, you're crazy. Importance is also really high. This car led the Japanese revolution in the early 2000s, where we all told Japanese car companies we wanted their cool performance cars they were saving for Japan, and it was interest in this car that paved the way for the WRX, the STI, the Evo, and eventually the R35 GTR. I always say the importance category basically measures whether you would have the car in a museum, and my car museum would definitely include an R35. 34 GTR, it gets a 9 out of 10. Add it up and the total weekend score is 39 out of 50, which places it up there with some all-time greats, including the Lamborghini Countach. It deserves it. On to the daily category, starting with features. The Skyline is fine, but even with its crazy screen, it's not anywhere near as well-equipped as modern cars, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Next up is comfort. It's a little harsh, but not punishing, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is high. The Skyline's engine is known for reliability until you start trying to get 900 horsepower out of it, and the interior is fine, but neither are exceptional, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is next. Trunk space is decent, but not exceptional. However, the Skyline gets a little boost here for having a back seat, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, there's value, which is really hard to rate. I always rate the car in front of me, and in this case, these Motorex cars are really expensive for what they are, especially considering the R34 GTR will be legal to import in a few years. It gets a 6 out of 10, but I'll probably feel differently when Japanese market cars start coming over a lot cheaper. Add it all up, and the total daily score is 25 out of 50, tying it with the E46 M3. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is 64 out of 100, which means it scored higher than any other car car its age. I guess that makes sense. After all, this is Godzilla.